Kisses are allowed. That's fine. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Joy Zaremka. Uh, welcome so much to this afternoon's session on examining power and privilege, three social movements examined. Um, I think we're in for an incredible treat today. We have some, some experts that are going to really delve into what did these three particular movements, and we're looking at the women's movement, the civil rights movement, and the LGBT movement, look like over the last 50 years. And it's interesting, as I was sort of thinking a bit about this panel in particular, I thought, oh, interestingly, as a black gay woman, uh, this panel speaks to me <laughs> in a variety of ways. Um, you know, I, somebody who embodies all three of those movements, uh, it's interesting for me to think about uh, what that means for me as an, in a leadership position of an organization that's been around for 50 years and an organization that has struggled at times with race, class, gender, um, ignored sexuality. Um, what does that mean uh, in this day and age? Uh, and I'm going to start with just a very short uh, story, if I may. And it involves getting ready for this uh, conference. Um, I had a lot of different people doing a lot of things, and I'm standing in the lobby with one of my staff members, who's an older white woman. And in walks two suited men who really want our business. They want us to, they want to actually be our real estate brokers. <laughs> so they come in and they say, uh, you know, glad to have this meeting. Can we please uh, have him, you know, come, come meet with you? I said, okay, come to my office. And they said, no, no, no. Can she come to the meeting? And my staff person looks at me kind of frantically because she was writing these little uh, two, two bit uh, bios that are uh, taking amazing people and trying to, you know, summarize them in two sentences or less. So she was a little frantic. So she looks at me like, please don't make me go to this meeting. And I said, no, no, it's okay, come on. And he goes, well, I really want the woman, uh, no, I really want the person who's making the financial decisions to be in on this meeting. Um, which was mind boggling to me at the time. You know, I said, just, okay, come on. You know, <laughs> um, since, at first I was upset that he would think that I would not be that person. But then I realized that that's his experience. You know, he sells real estate in DC to nonprofits. He walks in, he finds a black secretary and a white woman in charge. Um, so what does that say when we think about how, has th how have things changed, how have things not changed over 50 years, and what does that mean for our movement and for our organizations? Um, so without you know, taking up too much time, I really want to turn this over to, as I said, experts in the field who will take us through the, the real examination of how far we've come, how far we still really need to go. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Harriet Barlow. Um, who, uh, when I asked what should I say for her bio, she says, still kicking after all these years. <laughs> That's it. Uh, but she's, she's more amazing than that. She's the founding director of Blue Mountain Center, which is a uh, progressive, uh, center for progressive activists and artists. Um, the two things that we're trying to combine here uh, at this festival. Um, you know, and I think what's also amazing is because she has worked with so many organizations and been on so many boards, she's thinking not only about social movements, but just how do you, how do you make change, how do you make it institutionally? How do you change structure? So really excited to hear um, from, from Harriet. Uh, that will be followed by uh, Annette Friedman. Um, Annette Fa actually, Annette Fa and I have been at IPS at almost the same amount. He's sort of like my older brother because he came one month before me 14 years ago. Um, and he was the director of Salsa, which um, offered uh, workshops and classes for organizers and activists for many years, and now is our events coordinator. And so anybody who knows Netfa knows he's a DC staple um, on bringing progressive people, thoughts, speakers, movies, uh, et cetera, to the area. And then finally, we're going to end um, with Sanho Tree, who has been my silent mentor at, at IPS, and just because I'd like to follow him around to various conferences that he's gone to and things that he's done, um, just because he has figured out how to, to meld, uh, let's say, strange bedfellows and, and make change, um, even when you might think you're sleeping with the enemy. Um, and <laughs> I'm not that promiscuous. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so Sanho will um, take us through uh, thinking a little bit what's ha about what's happening in the LGBT community. Um, so without further ado, may I turn it over to you? Hi, thanks so much. It is, of course, a privilege and uh, I hope fun for all of us to be here together. Uh, and I hope that this is a conversation 
not a series of talks, and I hope that you will be as engaged in it as, as I hope to be. Um, just a couple of notions to contribute to this question about looking back over a movement um, from a 50-year perspective. The women's movement um, actually goes, as you know, far goes back much farther than that. And uh, American exceptionalism aside, we didn't invent it. <laughs> and I think it's important for us to remember not only that we didn't invent it, but that as we have lived it, the various waves of it, it has expressed many of the tensions, uh, many of the dynamics of American political life that we experience today. So for example, um, the early, the first wave feminists, as they like to be called, as you probably know, came out of uh, the abolition movement and linked the movement for for freedom to the uh, for for African Americans to the movement for freedom for women. Um, they got bollocked up by World War One because, as has been true historically. It is extremely difficult in the history of movements to integrate going forward if you didn't integrate at the beginning in your analysis. So I will say here, this is my first opportunity at this great weekend to say that I think one of the great contributions of the Institute for Policy Studies over its lifetime is to remind us and model the importance of beginning with and nourishing an integrative analysis. Because without it, what you have is that fracture. And this is what happened again in the second wave of feminism, which is the wave of my lifetime, my first young activist feminist life. Uh, most people think that the feminist, that wave was uh, begun by the dynamics that followed Betty Friedan's uh, publication of The Feminine Mystique. And, the very powerful writing of people such as Gloria Steinem. And it's, it certainly was um, spurred by writing, but it was also spurred by time. And I think this is another element that we really need to take into account when we think of the history of this movement. Um, not everyone has time to write books, to participate culturally, in even something as genial as sitting over wine in an evening with a bunch of women, becoming friends with them by coming to some common understanding of your suffering. Um, so just, you know, tag time as, a, as what I think plays an important role along with analysis and integrative analysis in where what movements look like and where they go or don't go. In my time, um, and I think Ruth Rosen has written about this beautifully in her history of the women's movement, the world split open, and I recommend that, that narrative to you. In my time, there was um, what I think of as another Americanism in the way work was done. There was a very strong tendency to go for more instead of sitting back and thinking about what constitutes better. And better in my way of looking at things is what raises all with a minimum of collateral damage to any. And so when we look at what people were striving for, um, you know, it's a little bit like the leaning in question. Um, are you leaning in for yourself? Are you le leaning in for privilege? Or are you leaning in for all? And I think we could say flipply, well, that's whether you're leaning in to the right or you're leaning in <laughs> to the left. Um, but I think that what, what complicated the issue, and I think this raises the thorny question of identity politics, is whether we were really talking just about women, or we were talking just about white women, or we were talking about white women of privilege, because there were plenty of white women out there, my friends, who had no time or consciousness or psychological freedom um, to engage in this. And, and I, 
I sometimes ponder something I've never read anything about, and I hope maybe somebody will write about it in the nation someday, <laughs> um, about why we don't think about the contributions of uh, the war on poverty as uh, something that enabled better. Because so much of the work that was done, for example, the fostering of Head Start, was better for everybody who needed that lift. And I always hold up as paradigmatic of the best of what the, the second wave women's movement achieved. I hold up Title IX. Mm -hmm. And most intellectual privileged people don't think that something that most people thought was about sports was really essential to changing the nature of possibility for large numbers of people. But I can say in my work with organizers, I have met more young women of color who are people of strength and confidence and team players and know how to fight for what they believe is right, who have talked about their experience playing basketball, playing soccer, playing whatever. And, you know, again, this may not be from the depths of analysis, the paradigmatic issue, but for me, it's representative of a way of thinking about what the goals are that are actually going to move things better for all, rather than more for some. And I think invariably, more always ends up being for some, unless it's something like Social Security or Medicare or something, in which case it's really about better. Um, so as I mentioned to John, um, I spent a year of my life organizing women's groups. They were almost exclusively white. They were almost exclusively among women who either wanted to go to college and, and did actually because of the women's movement or had gone to college. I didn't feel apologetic about that at, all, at the time at all, and I still don't. But it sure was a problem in the work. And I certainly wouldn't try to ascribe at all to the problem of time. I think it was a problem of just plain old stupidity. It wasn't, in my view and my experience, malicious. It wasn't that people said, oh, no, we, we'll take care of this for everyone else. It was just that blanket ignorance people have, um, a lot of people have, most people have, and I obviously had at the time, about what's missing. And I, I think that one of the great contributions of the third wave feminism that is now very much in play and is very much driven by women of color who are in academia and in, who, who are looking at this much more from a global dynamic than exclusively from a US dynamic, is that there is this intensive grappling with what was missing and what's missing now and how to fix that. And the how to fix that part is, I think, the challenge that we all need to participate in with younger people going forward. I, just, I don't want to take more than my time, but I want to say one other thing that I think is really, really important and that we should remember when Cora Weiss is, is being honored this weekend. Not only was this a, a, move, a, a movement that, that um, the United States did not invent, it also has not seen its finest expression domestically, I believe. And I think that one of the under uh, honored um, heroes, if you will, or heroines of the, of the advance of the women's movement is the United Nations. Starting with the U.S. Declaration of Human Rights in 1946 and then, and 40, the, sorry, in 48, which came in part from the 46 Commission on the Status of Women, the U.N. has fostered around the globe opportunities for women to come together who are not already agreeing they're not already agreeing consciously or subconsciously. And it has provided fora, it has provided mechanisms in which people can study and learn together and with a dignity of purpose and process that I think we lacked in the second feminist movement in the United States. Um, I do think the, the, the worst moment of bringing that all home to me was the Anita Hill hearings. And I, that's a moment in history nobody who thinks about feminism in this country should ever, ever allow themselves to forget and that we need to look at a lot more. So um, I think that I just would like to close. I'm not sure how many minutes we were supposed to have. But I want to close with what I think is uh, a very positive sense of the way forward, 
which is the statement out of the Beijing, UN Beijing Women's Conference in 1995, where after great dissent over very many aspects of, of cultural difference about, you know, clitorectomies and abortion and being having your hair covered and the role of women versus vis-a-vis -vis rather verse, than versus men. And great, intense, multi-year um, intra-movement dialogue. They wrestled themselves to a statement that I wish we had worked from when I was an ardent activist, feminist, ex I hope never exclusively, but when that was my main work. And, and this is a, just one sentence. The call for gender mainstreaming understands itself as letting women and men experience equal conditions for realizing their full human rights and that they should have the opportunity to contribute fully and benefit fully from national, all national, political, and social development. If you pause with that for a minute, there are two very, very, in my view, very enlightened and distinctive things. One is that a women's conference came out talking about women and men globally. And that the other was that it is about realizing your full human rights potential. And it's not about some fanciful notion of equality that always gets played out badly because of privilege. So that's it. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, okay, just my uh, random thoughts that I jotted down when I thought about the, the topic, um, and particularly the history or the lessons from the Civil Rights Movement, or we could also say adjacent movements that may not be identified but are associated with that era, like the Black Power Movement and, you know, particularly movements that are considered nationalist movements in the U.S. Um, I think there is one, the first thing is that, and I think you touched on it already, Harry, in terms of uh, what we would call challenging the historic divides within the movement. Um, if we look at the movement, um, if we look, we generally refer to the left, we say the left, and often that kind of leaves out the fact, can leave out the fact that we're talking about a spectrum when we talk about right and left, and that there's right and left within the left. <laughs> and so if we look at the, the left, as we might want to refer to it, and look at that there are historical divides within it that have and impeded our progress and impeded the the absolute the, the winning of, of qualitative gains and not just uh, privilege um, and so when we're honest and we look at it, we, we can identify all kinds. I don't even need to, to name them. I um, mean, I think you just did a great job of doing that anyway. Um, but I think some, one of the things that uh, I've thought of is how we tend to, in some circles, uh, negate, some of us negate the contributions and the lessons that come from the more radical of those of us, uh, like the Black Panther Party or the, the American Indian Movement, the, you know, uh, the Brown Berets and, and uh, Lords, Young Lords. And one of the things, regardless of what we might think of them as this radical element that, that uh, that represents a, a more violent confrontation with the state, we forget other things. One, the violent acts were, or violent, the violent characterization was more of uh, a response to violence against our community. So we're really not talking about people who thought of violent overthrow, more so defense of our communities, which was indispensable. But one of the more, um, uh, I think, profound things was creating the world that we wanted to see was what a lot of them did. You know, the soup, ki soup kitchens and the, the uh, after school programs and the breakfast in schools and the medical, a lot of people did, they met medical uh, um, projects where they were providing medical care in their communities. And I think we forget that this can go a long way also in building the movement. I think, think of this often when I think of electoral politics and I'm a person that doesn't really, uh, I think I'm very disenchanted by the electoral process in this country and uh, particularly I don't consider myself a Democrat or a Republican or, or that there's any viable solution and ultimate um, salvation for the people in those parties, but I don't discount the electoral process in general because we it's obviously a vehicle, it's a tool that we should be able to use and if we look at 
those uh, movements that have been able to create conditions on the ground actually and in involve people in these solutions, involve people in uh, uh, taking their health care into their own hands or their, their, uh, their food situation, um, and how we can use that to build a movement where we in fact identify leaders in that movement who are fortified in that process and then we get involved in the nomination aspect. A lot of times, you know, let's face it, we're looking at people who are nominated, candidates who are nominated by some process that's controlled by the elite and then we choose from their, their selection instead of being involved in the nomination process, which would require uh, going outside this binary Democrat Republican thing, but it, but the point is, and, and I'm not just talking about a third party candidate. I'm talking about building a movement that goes that uses uh, these processes in conjunction with electoral politics. In other words, we we're don't we're in our communities. We're we're involving the most affected people. They also have a genius and, a, and an understanding of situations that aren't always, uh, when I'm talking about class privilege, less cl uh, class privileged people have a genius and a, and a perspective that's not always uh, counted. And I think you also alluded to that too. We're going to say a lot of the, some of the same things here. But we, we need to find ways to incorporate that and, and see how we can involve things like the electoral process or engage in that in a way that we're choosing leaders. We're choosing people who we want to run. We're building and using the campaign to elect them as also a movement building process. Not just a campaign to get someone elected, but a campaign to politically educate the masses, politically get the masses politically involved in the changes, identifying the most fundamental uh, things that we need to change and, and human conditions, food, clothing, housing, health care, you know, the basic things, how do we can start there. And then there's also other things. We can also use these process, processes to uh, uh, challenge each other about our perceptions about race and class and, 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 and women's rights and homophobia and these kind of things. We're, we're engaged with the people and we're using the ideas and discussing the ideas. Like you mentioned, there, there's, uh, there are people who are not always, they're not already on the agreement consciously or unconsciously, we need to have that. That's a dynamic thing. So we can build this process um, and have this condition through things like just going into our communities and trying to address the fundamental, I mean, materially address them. This brings me uh, to another point, or two, a few points. One, um, I think that uh, another lesson from these, this civil rights movement, that process that we that I began to talk about, um, and one that Malcolm X is actually uh, good for helping us understand is the relationship between, or the dichotomy, so to speak, at some point, at some times, between civil rights and human rights. Um, and civil rights and human rights, uh, if we look at some of the things as human rights violations that oppressed people are going through, we actually are easier transcending uh, the, this national confine the national confine into the international arena. And I'm not just talking about the policy makers who have the, the ability, and I mean, in any place in the world, um, to have the ability to make changes or, or enact legislation, but I'm also talking about how uh, the people on the ground see themselves in vis a vis each other. Um, so, for example, in the Africa, the black community, I say African community, a lot of times we don't identify beyond being black Americans. You know, and so when there's something happening in Africa or any other place in the black world, we don't think about that because we got our own problems here, kind of attitude. But we have to realize that the problems are there's actually the same uh, cause of the same problem, and they have a historical root that is connected. And if we don't look at each other, and plus we're uh, the larger the numbers and the larger the way we can identify each other, the stronger we are in terms of uh, confronting these problems. And also the genius that can become contributed, attributed to it that is from different uh, slightly cultural backgrounds and cultural uh, experiences. So we're talking human rights to civil rights to human rights brings people to things like from black nationalism to pan-Africanism. And I'm not just talking about you know, people of color, this can, the same type of thinking can go on with any affected group, any oppressed group can, uh, can transcend a confine, a, conf uh, a, very, a very confining uh, perspective into a broader and more effective perspective and also something that really brings the human family more together and, you know, really tears down the lines. I think people often talk about internationalism without um, thinking about the fact that 
uh, internationalism implies the existence of nations, apply, implies the, uh, that there are already national divides, and that for us to transcend into internationalism, there has to be some recognition and acknowledgement first about what nationalism is. And really, we have to tease it out, you know. Um, what, what is the relationship of people in second class or no class, uh, no no class citizens in this country to Americanism, to American exceptionalism, whatever. I mean, a lot of people, even uh, Frantz Fanon and a lot of people today talk about the colony within the colony. So uh, there are people if, in their conditions and there are people who can look and study the, uh, our situation and not feel like I'm an American. I generally don't use that term. And there's a reason for it. And I don't have any ill will toward anyone who does. That's not the, the and I don't think it's divisive. I think it's actually transcending uh, things to where we're looking at each other beyond the national confines. So, and then let me get to, there was another uh, point I wanted to make in terms of doing things on the ground in the, during the civil rights era and even before, those people, the people that came and organized together to do things to challenge the system, to challenge the elites whose interests were um, counter to theirs, did it with, had to do it with uh, financial independence. So, of course, those who, who in, had an interest in the status quo could not be dependent on, by and large, I'm not talking about absolutes, there is always somebody who's privileged and who realizes a contradiction and will, will do something to help it. But in general, we're, you know, the, those who are privileged and benefit from the status quo are separated from those who don't and can feel challenged by the advances and the, and the um, advocacies of, of people who are, who are uh, oppressed. And so, um, but so there was a point in time where we had to, you know, grassroots organizing, grassroots fundraising, you know, doing things in the churches. I mean, these are the things that, that made us financially independent. And I think it's important because what we see now is um, what people refer to as the uh, nonprofit industrial complex. Um, and so the nonprofit industrial complex is something that takes good missions and good people and can dilute their activities and and I used to I forgot that I used to say in the salsa program is that sometimes you could start an organization with a particular mission and, and build um, uh, and and try to get money to fulfill your mission and before you know it next thing you're trying to fulfill your, you're trying to change your mission so you can get money and you've really you haven't realized that you actually deviated from your original uh, from your original intent and so your mission can slowly change without before you know it you're looking up and you're you know not even pursuing the thing that you're originally pursuing so I think we need to uh, really be you know look at this issue contribution of the the, the issue of the prison I mean the, <laughs> the nonprofit industrial complex, but but really all these industrial complexes. What is industrial? I mean, there's a lot of things that they really um, come to the cutting edge of what who who benefits uh, from things and how are are how are their interests divergent from the masses of the people? Um, and so that was. Um, I think I almost said everything. Oh, one last point. <laughs> One last one is the culture. I think the young people now, particularly through hip hop and the culture music, um, are are uh, a reflection of some very revolutionary things for us. Not in general, of course, not those that are um, in the industry, 50 Cent or anything like that. <laughs> but the, there's a lot of hip hop and ideas that are much more sophisticated than the than the progressive music before. I mean, and and in so many ways, they've transcended a lot of the ideas, um, and we can see it if we're connected to the to that most. Uh, more revolutionary uh, cultural expression. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, let me just say that um, I'm uh, filling in for Danny Sigwald, who is a young activist, and we try very hard to have three generations represented on these panels. But um, uh, my people age well, so <laughs> for the record, I'm going to say that I'm 29 and holding. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes. <laughs> but uh, I actually began my career at IPS in uh, 1989, uh, working with Gar Alperwitz. I spent six years working on a book with him on the uh, decision to use the atomic bomb in, in World War II. And so I spent those years, day and night, immersed in World War II. I spent more you know, years studying the war than the, the US spent fighting it. Uh, but at the same time, what was going on uh, outside of my professional life was one of the most remarkable social movements um, in terms of the uh, incredibly heavy lifts. So you had not only the LGBT movement, but also the AIDS crisis happening at the same time. And, uh, uh, and I want to draw some parallels between those two things. 
and I'm just going to talk from my own perspective. I'm not going to talk about uh, transgender uh, perspectives, or and I, I'm smart enough not to talk, speak on behalf of lesbians. Um, <laughs> Mama didn't raise no fools. <laughs> they can speak for themselves. Another uh, parallel um, that also troubled me, I mean, it shows how far we still have to go, was when gays in the military came up. Mm -hmm. And again, I was still immersed in World War II uh, research at the time. Mm -hmm. And I actually spoke out um, critically of gays in the military, mm -hmm. uh, which made me really popular at the time. <laughs> um, this is 1993, 94. And because the reason, you know, what was the point of the LGBT movement. Uh, it was to rehumanize us in the face of a society that had dehumanized us. Right? And what is the point of a military? Uh, the point of the military, ultimately, mm. is to condition mm -hmm. an 18-year-old to be able to mm -hmm. kill a complete stranger mm -hmm. for reasons of state mm -hmm. um, on a split second without thinking, without judgment. Right? And as the military says, if you, if you train like you fight, you'll fight like you train. You have to do this robotically because if you stop, it's not normal for an 18-year-old to murder a complete stranger. It is not normal. Mm -hmm. It takes conditioning to do that. And the way they do that is they, through a process of dehumanization, mm -hmm. boot camp. Right? Who's ever been through boot camp here? Anyone? Well, okay. Good. <laughs> well, first thing they do to you in boot camp, right, is to take away your clothes, your jewelry, um, your, your anything that, that made you an individual, to break you down, to become part of a larger unit. Mm -hmm. And then they train you methodically to, to push the button or, 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 or you know, jab the bayonet or pull the trigger uh, mm -hmm. without thinking. So that when you're looking down the trenches, uh, down the barrel of your rifle, you're willing to kill another human being whose history you do not know, whose culture you don't understand, whose guilt or innocence is not for you to determine, to you pull the trigger simply because um, they're wearing the wrong clothes that day. It's a fashion crime. <laughs> wrong color uniform. Therefore, you die. Why do we? Why are we so obsessed with joining that movement and becoming part of that? My heroes, uh, and, I, and I don't mean that, that uh, gays and lesbians should be persecuted in the military. That's not what I'm saying at all. But why do we want this? My heroes are the people who fought not for the state in someone else's country. We're always defending our freedom in someone else's country, right? <laughs> uh, not on behalf of the state, but my heroes are the people who fought nonviolently against the state, against their own state. It's the Hollywood 10, it's the ACLU, it's the civil rights workers, it's people who fought uh, the state that tried to take their rights away. Mm -hmm. That's where your real freedoms have been challenged historically. Not from outside uh, actors, mm -hmm. but your own state. Uh, and so, uh, anyway, I've, 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 I've Spoken out quite a bit on this, and it's starting to get some traction, but um, it's been a long, long struggle. Um, and then I think uh, the other thing that uh, intrigues me is what's happening uh, in Cuba. Um, those of you who come to, to Saul's uh, uh, commemoration this, uh, this evening, you'll see, uh, you'll, you'll hear about his latest film that will be finished soon, I hope. And it's about the LGBT struggle in Cuba. Uh, and there's an incredible revolution that's been going on this past decade in Cuba. I don't know if people are aware of it. Um, and Cuba used to be one of the most homophobic places in this hemisphere. It's just a, a god-awful place to be, uh, to be gay. Uh, and against the wishes of the party, against uh, conventional wisdom, uh, Mariela Castro uh, fought this incredible struggle. Uh, she was head of the uh, Center on Sexuality Studies, and uh, she's straight. But uh, she, the more she learned, the more uh, passionate she became. Uh, and she became a very public advocate. It, it helped that she was Raul Castro's daughter. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, this did not exactly please her parents to do this, or, or the party for that matter. But she did it, and she's transformed the country uh, in a way that I, I, it's hard to describe. They'll probably have gay marriage at the federal level before the US does. Mm. Uh, I mean, this is uh, mm. remarkable. It, all the textbooks have been changed now uh, in, in the country. The television programs, all it, it, the state now funds uh, gender reassignment surgery. Mm. Right? Uh, get that under Obamacare. <laughs> um, you know, uh, and uh, so it's another case of a revolution within a revolution happening nonviolently. Um, and uh, that, that bears a lot of study. Uh, and, uh, and finally, when I look back at uh, the social views of the early 1960s, my work today, uh, and for the past 15 years, has been on the war on drugs and, and how do you end it and replace it with, uh, with policies that actually promote public health and safety. And one of the biggest obstacles is the UN treaties on uh, this, it's called the Single Convention on Nar Narcotic Drugs. 
1961 treaty that uh, almost all nations are signatory to, and there are two other treaties that follow it. But, and this is what's held up by the State Department, by other countries as well, as saying, oh, we can't legalize, we can't do this and that because it's locked by these treaties. And the State Department goes to great lengths to saying, you must never reopen these treaties. The drug warriors want to protect that. Um, it is you know, un immutable. Um, they got it right the first time. And I would simply ask, what other social views from 1961 would we possibly tolerate today with regard to indigenous rights, with regard to LGBT rights, uh, women's rights, uh, the discourse on race, you know, those views from the 1960s were so, um, even within IPS, I mean, there are mm -hmm. IPSers who, and Mark Raskin will, will say uh, that he was just horrified and, and, and looking back on, on, on the discourse on gender in those days. Uh, and so what other views would we accept today from that era uh, when it comes to social justice? Uh, and if, it's, if, if we can't accept those other types of discourse, then it's time we also opened up uh, our, our way we think about drugs and drug policy. So that's uh, kind of my way of tying together all the different things that I've worked on while I'm at IPS. But, uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and open this up to the um, audience in just a moment. But, but first, I have a, a couple of questions I just wanted to put to our panelists. Um, I think I'd be remiss to not uh, first talk a little bit about silos versus intersectionality. Um, at IPS, we spend a lot of time figuring out how do we bring different movements together, how do we break down those silos. And so I'm interested um, if, if the three of you could perhaps reflect a little bit on um, how do we, in today, I guess we can talk just about today, how do these um, different struggles come together? You know, for example, we heard um, Sando talk a little bit about the, uh, the in a disciplinary problem of AIDS and how that brought groups together. And you talked very much about the sort of exclusive, exclusivity of the struggle that you were working on at that moment. Um, how do we get the different groups to come together if the struggle is not necessarily the same? Well, I'll give it a little kick. Um, <laughs> several things come to mind, as I said, uh, when I was speaking before, I think the central discipline is the discipline of analysis. I think um, we succumb to kind of the, the shortest end of our nose kind of um, identity politics when I identity is the beginning and the end of the question. And if we ask ourselves always, identity in what context? You know, what structures of society, what aspects of who decides have put us in this position in which we do not feel as if we are able to exercise what we feel are our human rights? And what are those forces, how are those forces playing out in other parts of community, of the human family, of, of the globe? And when we look at that question in terms of what the forces are that are enclosing you know, my human rights as a farm worker and ask it um, with others, you know, sort of open up the doors and see who else is out there being enclosed by the same forces, I think we end up with a very different politics. And one of the um, little epiphanitos, mine don't get much beyond that, um, that I had was when I read after the first Bush, the first Bush, the W, election that 50%, 57% of gay white males had voted for George Bush. I said, analyze this. <laughs> and, and what I realized was part of it, I, well, I made this up, so realizing you have to understand is what I thought, not necessarily what it is. But here's what I thought. I thought, these are people talking primarily to themselves and each other because a lot of them are still in the closet. And they, in fact, when they were discussing this poll, they said that they, it was all anonymous. Are you a gay man? Are you a white gay man? Are you a closeted white gay man, etc.? And I thought, okay, well, that's the first problem, because they are only talking to each other, and they are talking to each other as people who, generally, I suspect among this polling group anyway, were people who were doing pretty well financially and wanted to protect that. 
And the issue of taxes at that moment was probably larger to them than the issue of the fact that they were gay. As I said, I made all this up inside my head, but it felt right because it felt like many other situations in which people were only talking to themselves and each other. Those lovely white women that I was organizing in suburbs around the District of Columbia, et cetera. And so that, that's my first thought. Um, okay, when I think of that, I think more about uh, the silo things and when we talk about them, they're, they seem to be more along or very much along uh, issue lines versus these other things that divide us. And I think the other things that divide us are probably easier to transcend because uh, we can just understand how people are oppressed. And, but in terms of, it, and I, I'm going to go back to the, the, um, the nonprofit industrial complex question again, because I think that when it comes to a lot of groups and organizations working on things, they're, uh, they're confined or inhibited by um, what funders want to see and what people who, you know. And so you have to report to them, you have to kind of tailor that. And a lot of times those things, that, that world um, keeps things siloed. It, it prevents us and inhibits us from making the connections between things uh, and the inter understanding the interconnections between things. So I think one, it's, it will be about um, us trying to create or find some way of, of uh, it being the most affected people involved and the most affected people actually being able to fund what they come up with. You know, this, for instance, right in this room, if we had this conversation, with the with the most affected people, and I'm, I'm not saying no one here is affected. We're all affected in some way, but the most affected people, it would look different, you know. Even if we filled the room, especially if we filled the room with people of different races, gender, and just made it, very, but still the most affected, this would be a different conversation. Uh, it would even even the form of it and how people express themselves would be different. And I think, but the solutions also, and the fact that things are interconnected with each other. There's you know there's connections between racism and environmental degradation. I mean all these things, and that will come out because they're going to be they're going to be expressing what's what's happening, what their challenges are in life. And so we have to create those forms. I think, and, and I think we yeah we have to create those forms. And again, also I think that we should engage when we engage in work and and the campaign work, um, we need to, and it needs to have a, as an integral part of it um, a political education, pro a popular political education process. Because we don't know everything, but we do have some knowledge. And when people share their knowledge, and then new ideas arise and new solutions arise from that. Um, since we've, we're, we're talking about a bunch of third rail issues, or at least what used to be third rail issues, mm -hmm. uh, the solution I think um, encompasses another third rail issue. Um, currently, which is education reform, uh, beginning with a bulldozer <laughs> on academia. Uh, well, I went to Hampshire College, let me just confess. Uh, it's a hippie college, alternative school. But the first thing they did when they opened in 1970 was get rid of departments. Right? And they tore down those departmental walls and encouraged team teaching and interdisciplinary thinking. And that is key because there are so many petty departments all over the country, not all of them, but, but a lot of them, that are incredibly petty, turf conscious. Uh, and they really, if, you, if you're a poli-sci major at some schools, they don't want you studying sociology or taking courses in history or taking courses in political economy. Uh, the, the, partly because it, it's about uh, you know, having the best students in their department and their resource allocation and budgets, but it's also about uh, uh, insecurity of, of certain, certain professors. If those students start studying things and thinking outside the box, they're going to learn stuff that the professors don't know, and that's scary to a lot of people. It works that way in bureaucracy as well. You have to give, give up some control and trust people to, to, and I think that's one of the most interesting areas today is that space between uh, these disciplines that is the new frontier and the, the most important frontier because the real world never gives us problems or rarely gives us problems that fit in nice little academic boxes. Those are artificial. Right. They were drawn up for, for the convenience of, of, of academic bureaucracies uh, and disciplines and, and the Western approach to looking at things. But, and, and, and so 
the most pressing issues are the ones that cross so many of those boundaries today, whether it's climate change, whether it's the war on drugs, one of the most inter interdisciplinary problems you can possibly encounter. All these tough issues are interdisciplinary. And if we don't get people to think outside the box and color outside the line and make those linkages, we will forever be stuck in these little individual fiefdoms and bureaucracies. And it carries over to the NGO world, the foundation world, the program officers were trained in one discipline and that's their thing and that's what they're going to fund. But if you're doing it with a problem that crosses disciplines, forget it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's yeah. confusing. I need to correct myself. Please. It wasn't George W. Bush. It was the second Ronald Reagan election. Oh. And I bet by George Bush that would have been very different. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and open it up um, to the audience, and then uh, we've got four there in the back. So let's start with Ethelbert. Stanho, you mentioned you Hampshire, so maybe I might excuse your comments, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you you sort of made the statement about gays in the military as if, you know, why would one go into the military? But I think when you look at that movement, it's people who are already in the military concerned about their rights. I also think when we look at social movements, it is a heroic movement. Uh, you can put aside how you feel about the military. But the struggle by black soldiers or by women in the military is a very heroic struggle. It has an impact on the movement outside of the military. Uh, and I think when we look at the gay movement between there, it's also as important. So I just want to, you know, make that comment. Okay. Um. John? Sure. Yeah, I, first of all, thank you for, uh, for what you do and for this uh, conversation. And I, it, it made me think, I'm 58 years old, and I think anyone sort of my age and older uh, who is white, in my case, white, male, straight, um, I grew up in a world where racism, sexism, and homophobia were rampant and accepted. And so to think of the sea change that you all have described does feel like, one of you used the word a revolution, a cultural revolution, um, e even though there are all the problems that you just described. I, I remember being about in the early 2000s, there was a period where I did two or three radio shows uh, ag inter you know, against a conservative think tank leader. And this was a time when when Bush was in power and the Republicans controlled everything. And, and in each case, when we got into s issues like this, th they came across as beleaguered. They, they felt that they were losing.